Welcome to the darkest timeline Welcome. with Ken Jung and Joel McHale. I'm gonna say every intro like that because I know it right. annoys you, like, Joel. So like your bad Boulon Rouge audition. <laughs> is Where? there any when you say Ken Jung and audition, the word bad is is redundant, so it's fine. I get it. You've made your living on straight offers. But yeah, yeah, offer only. I, Welcome to offer only wait, with what, Ken Jung. And what is the thing you auditioned for that you got way back when? Before we get to it all, like what's oh, the thing you're like knocked up? Got it. Knocked up. That was that was that, an audition. That was an audition. That was a series of auditions. It was like Gillian. I on uh, Community. I didn't get that part until after the table read. So I had a table read for Knocked Up, get this, with Seth Rogen, Katherine Heigl, it was Paul Rudd, Adam Scott, um, Jonah Hill, Jason Segel, Martin Starr. It was <laughs> like everybody who is anybody in comedy was at that First table program. read. And it was in front of Judd and everybody at Universal. And apparently, I think later on I found out it was like, might have been Gary Shandling and all these other giants. I was so nervous, and I was still working at Kaiser. I was still a doctor, and I, I just, it was just a do or die situation. It was like being on the free throw line, you know, with like one second right. left, and then in, in second grade, in second grade, and uh, and I definitely felt like in second grade because I, I was completely. No, overwhelmed. you went in it. That was an NBA free throw line. That that's, was a, that was definitely that's an all star free throw line. That's and it's funny. Happened. I still I still remember the producer Shauna Robertson, who worked with Judd Apatow at that time a lot, and uh, she she was very clear to tell me, you know, you know, Judd likes you, but you know, you haven't been you haven't gotten the role yet. We just want to see how you do at this table read. And literally, I was like, this is the most nerve wracking moment yeah. ever in show business. And then. But what did calm me down was Seth Rogen did say right when he entered the room, he said, man, loved your tape, dude. It was just like oh, it, that great. relaxed me a lot. And then uh, and then later I found out it was Seth Rogen and Evan Goldberg that saw my tape because I read it for Allison Jones, who really gave me a career and uh, the ca a esteemed casting director that does all the best comedies. She just put me on the map and um, she sent that to uh, Seth and Evan and then they helped single me out and sent that to Judd. And then um, I still remember at the end of the at the end of the table read, Judd said, "You know, great job or fantastic job." And like within four days, I got the part. And that, and then he has allowed me to annoy the world now for the last thirteen years. So it's his fault. You're, yep, <laughs> you're a virus that I never want. To be <laughs> Ken Sean. The world's a better but place. But I'm a, I'm a, I'm an attenuated, weakened virus. You know, I'm not. <laughs> I don't even know what that means. What's it? Give me an example of it. Oh, hey, it's Daniel. Day. Hey. <laughs> Why do you look like you're 31? And I believe you. I mean, you. You're older than Ken, right? Am I? What Ken? Am I older than you? Yeah, I'm 23. Okay, um, you look. Um, I'm 83, so I yeah, am a little bit so, older. Than you. Oof. Yeah. I was talking to some of my millennial friends like Ross Butler and Lana Condor, uh, you know, kind of the you don't sound old at all. Asian, you have to name. Uh, Asian millennials uh, in entertainment. Um, you know, we were. Uh, yeah. um, but uh, that's how I always point out my millennial friends. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm 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 younger than Daniel and I look like his puffy uncle. You know what I mean? Yeah, well, <laughs> that's happened. Yeah. It's just not, it's just not fucking fair. You play his father play. in a play or something. The Hawaiian sun keeps you young. That's that's what it is. Would you say keeps you young? The, you... It's the Hawaiian sun that keeps you young. I don't think so. I've been in the Hawaiian sun and I've done some projects <laughs> and I've come back looking older and bigger. So I don't think I think that's just, I think that's just you. And you look, I mean, speaking of health, you look good, dude. I'm just this is our first time actually. We we talked over the phone, but the first time seeing you and a uh, man, dude, you look. Fucking amazing! I'm just so glad you're okay, man. Just so Thank glad. You. Thank you. So, wait, how long have you guys known each other? I we first met, and you may not remember this, Daniel. In 2006. Oh, I remember. It, yes, yes. It, I was doing stand up. I was still working at Kaiser. I was still a doctor, and 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 you were hosting a benefit for the Unforgettable Gala, basically oh. for the Corey M Journal, which is a really the biggest um, Asian American 
kind of uh, award show like in L.A. It's the longest running over 20 years. And um, they hired me to do stand up comedy for the evening. And uh, Daniel, uh, like, yeah, I think you int- gave me gave me an intro. And uh, and I kept calling you Asian Denzel the whole time. <laughs> that's right. That's right. <laughs> they get stopped by Asian Denzel, you know, <laughs> and you were endeared you to me right away because you know to be compared to Denzel Washington, that's that's yeah. your way in right there. <laughs> <laughs> were you? I like how you kind of were like you were mocking him with being yeah, just one of the greatest actors of all time. <laughs> that's pretty good. And that was a good way to go about it. That's good. It's good way. It was a good way to get in. Yeah, to get oh. in because um, Lost was really w- was just getting started, and my What's wife Lost? and I. Uh, Lost is a show about people on a desert island. Um, it was a desert remember, island because yeah. one of the guest stars on your show was actually a member of Lost, uh, Mr. Josh, Josh Holloway. I Josh believe. Holloway. Good. Good call. DDK. Yeah. Yeah, uh, connective tissue because we're trying to because I'm sure you know we have a lot of community fans watching this. They're like, "What's DDK's association um, with the show?" It's Josh Holloway who played the guy that Jeff Winger was threatened by in the second paintball episode. That's, that's right. Uh, that's actually an underrated gem of Jeff Winger because that made me laugh the whole time. The whole runner of him, like you know, you're not as good looking as me, but we'll see. How that goes. <laughs> I remember we busted into the closet to get all the paintballs, and I was like, now we'll see who's good looking. Yeah. <laughs> and, then, and then Troy Troy goes, You have a problem. <laughs> <laughs> and then there was posters of Jeff everywhere of me. And, and I was just like, My forehead is not that big. Right, right. <laughs> right. <laughs> and then oh, I think I think Josh's character at the end. Because there was like this kind of vague flirtation with him and Annie, and and he says, you know, he goes, not now, darling, too late, darling. I got I got Coldplay tickets or something like that. And, and Annie, Allison Brie goes, oh, like that. So yeah. that, that that was a cute exchange. I got to tell you guys, like uh, thanks to my son, um, we started binging Community uh, a few weeks ago, and uh, and so we've been watching. I mean, my son finished, he went from beginning to end, and I went almost all the way up through the end as well. And uh, Wow. Uh, I saw we the had you timeline on. episode, and so I now know where the name comes from. Uh, wow. And truly, we seem to be in the darkest timeline, don't we? Um, uh, yes. Yes. I think that's but, definitely but here's, safe here's to say. Thing. Here's the other thing I wanted to, to mention real quick is that I watched your table read of the episode uh, that you guys did for charity. And oh, thanks, I loved, brother. I absolutely loved it. And I, you know, what's funny is like, I hadn't seen the episode before I saw the table read. And after I I read, the, I saw the table read, I went to watch the episode and I was like, that table read was just as good, just as good. And like, wow. so much, being so much fun. And I, I really felt like uh, you guys were having a great time. And I, I was certainly having a great time watching. Daniel, what's your, what's your North Face size? I'm going to send you one of these jackets <laughs> as a result of that compliment. The whole North Face. So they thank you. Yeah. No, brother, thank you. Th- thank you. And thank you and your family for watching it. And uh, I, I really, man, coming from you and uh, given the show that you were on for six seasons, you know, Tran and I watched every episode. I believe there was a reference to Lost in the uh, Abed stop motion episode. Yes, there was. When they're like, it was, oh, yes, that's right. It was a, a little friends. bit of a roast. It was a little bit of a roast, but yeah. it was definitely, it was definitely out of love. And um, th- yeah, they had a DVD, like Abed had a DVD, the DVD, like first season of Lost. Yeah. Well, Damon and Damon Lindelof was our first question for the Vanity Fair Q and A afterwards, which didn't, which wasn't a part, I don't think of the YouTube video. I think that yeah. came later. Yeah, but, they had, I think Sony did a Sony did a second video with Variety, and um, there's a Q and A, and the first question was from Damon, so it was geez, yeah. yeah, so he's he was a he's a big community fan, so that was so there's a lot of mutual kind of uh, geek out moments, but but no man, I I mean throughout the years I've just I mean Daniel's been is pretty evident. I mean, he's been one of my role models because just even behind the scenes as an Asian American in entertainment, we've, we, we have just gone through so much and, and, you know, me having my own show and then Daniel, not only having been on multiple series, but also, um, to me, I really believe in addition to loss, your crowning achievement was he bought the rights to the good doctor from Korea 
Yeah. A very popular medical drama. drama. So he obtained the rights. Crazy. He had so, a production company, sold that to Sony, got the showrunner of House to be the showrunner of The Good Doctor, and now it just got renewed for its fourth season. So it's just you have man, done it. A first and, look deal with CBS, no? Is that still happening? That's uh, that's that was my first deal. I, right now, I have a first look deal with Amazon. Look at that. Yes. Gee. Yeah. But, but thank you guys. I mean, that's uh, you know, you guys are you're, you're all doing it in your own ways too. I mean, Ken. I mean, you had your own freaking show, man. <laughs> you had your your name on the title. <laughs> you yeah. Were well, you know? remember, remember that when that first season happened, you just happened to be in town and you and I had dinner and um, I won't Who tell paid? you. Where, yeah. huh? Who paid? Who paid? <laughs> oh, God. No. You know what? We're at the Soho House. And just we just say who ran. paid, Ken. That's cool. Oh, you're at the Soho House. Are you a member? The, huh? I, I, I was a member. So we just ran away after the dessert. Then, Wait. I know it's kind of weird. We just ran you, away. You we're a member? You're not a member anymore? Actually, <laughs> no, when, when but, were you thrown out, Ken? <laughs> <laughs> or do you need to borrow some money? I thought it was. I thought you're doing okay. <laughs> do you remember, Daniel? I forgot about this. I think I got you in the Soho House, right? Like, as remember? <laughs> you did. Oh my I wrote, god! I wrote I you. Totally a, forgot I about totally that. Forgot yes, that. You wrote okay. A recommendation. Yeah, uh, yeah, I wrote. I wrote. I said. Because you, you texted me. He goes, "Hey man, you remember Soho House?" I was like, "Yeah." He goes, Can't, "He goes, you need you need a recommendation." So I just emailed the person. I said I said something like, "As as one of the few." incredibly good looking Asian Americans in Hollywood, I recommend the other one. I said, <laughs> <laughs> That's a good wreck. And, and you got in in record time. Uh, so. All thanks to Dr. Ken Jung. <laughs> but Joel, I gotta say, man, just to, just to like round out the community love, your work on that show it was is pretty damn good. And and I I knew you from Talk Soup. So yeah. like that was the first thing I'd seen you in, so I didn't know that you were a, a bona fide actor. I thought you were like a, a talk show personality. But you know, in watching the the arc of the series, man, you you do some really really great stuff, and, and it's, it ain't easy, you know, being the lead of a show like that. I, well, I believe now I'm blushing, but when you look, so many people were on the show were untalented. And so almost anything <laughs> that you would do, you get scene, really stressed out. You'd be like, oh, that's, yeah. it's a it looks like a slam dunk, but it's really average. <laughs> my work. Uh, Ken, Ken, Ken knows what I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah, uh, you, yeah, you had a you had a, you had a bunch of people that did, I think they were first timers. I believe Chevy Chase that was the first his first time yeah. on camera. Is that right? Yeah, he had never <laughs> done anything. Yeah. First time yeah, ever. Has, he done? First time ever. I think ever. he had done one movie called Under the Rainbow, and I think that was it. Uh, I don't know. Uh, no, hey, Daniel, she's coming from you. Thank you. Look, I, uh, I, I, I'm going to be speechless, and it's very embarrassing to have people say nice things. So, uh, but coming from you, I'll take because, you know, you're a tremendous actor, and so now I wish I'm recording this, and now I can send it. <laughs> to different production companies, and I look forward to being on The Good Doctor. Uh, All right. Great. Well, we'll get you both. What if, we'll, let's, let's see if we can get you both on at the same time. <laughs> oh, that'll, that'll, oh be, yeah. that'll be great. That'll be great. We'll be the... Um, I'll be Schwarzenegger. You be DeVito, Ken. <laughs> Hi. Um, we're, we're here. We're, yeah, we're the identical twins here to uh, solve this uh, fraternal twin mystery. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think I In the case of the mystery twins at... Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I think we'll be it's just you know it's one of those things that like during the eighth season when your guys are just rolling in the syndication that we'll just come in like literally we can do anything we'll get Ken. <laughs> hey, right. hey what's your idea now now that you can do anything you want to in this what's your way of punishing the viewer he goes I know I'll get Ken to be on the show <laughs> that will punish the viewer it will challenge the viewer to see if they'll still watch the show if Ken if Ken appears just uh, saying hello like that. I, I think would. that would be the first and only time uh, that we would have an actual doctor play a right. doctor. If we can get you oh. as a doctor, that would be uh, that would be nice. That would be great to have me as uh, as the dumbest medical student ever. <laughs> yeah. Ken, this is not a old, this, Ken, Daniel's not making a documentary about your life. Okay, so <laughs> this is sorry. You walked right into it. You can't lob me these softballs without me doing something. I can't help myself. I look like a dick. <laughs>
<laughs> but no, I'm just it. It is. Um, yeah, man, you and I go way back uh, for so long. We we're just, you know, just back in the day. Even during Doctor Ken, I would just ask you for advice so much in terms of just how to, you know, how to kind of, you know, not only be the lead of a show, but just also just as an Asian American and just just the, the incredible amount of responsibility whether one likes it or not you just have that it's just always it's just always like in the back of your mind and it was um you really helped get me get me through that because there are a lot of times i would just call to uh i would just call and complain right <laughs> that daniel and i would well that's part of being on a show that's part of, that's, that's what you know if you want to hear an actor complain give him a job right <laughs> oh that's good that's really I'm um that could um, bring the mantra of community. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, Daniel, I'm gonna ask you a question that you've probably been asked in a thousand interviews. But what is the mathematical chances? What are the mathematical chances of someone getting on a series that shoots in Hawaii, stays on for the whole run, then gets on another series shot in Hawaii? Is there has there you're one in it's got one and a half a billion it has to be. Honestly, and I, I haven't done the math on this, but I don't know of another actor that has no. been on two shows that have shot back to back in Hawaii that have gone 100 episodes. I don't know of another epi an actor that's ever done that. So, um, yeah, if someone out there in podcast world knows, uh, let me know because I... You know, to go 100 episodes of any show is, yeah. is very, very rare. And then to do so twice... And then to do so in Hawaii is, uh, yeah, the odds There's, are pretty small. That's jumping over a 200 lasers. And I, I mean, I, I obviously, you're, you have, you raised your kids in Hawaii. You, I mean, you, that's, you had to. You've been there since 2004, right? That's exactly right, 2004. So we're on 16 years now in Hawaii. And look, I'm looking at your background. Your house is so much nicer than Ken's. <laughs> it, I've... I've, I've I've been to Daniel's house. It is it is so much nicer than than my house. It is like I love I love visiting. Every time I'm I'm in Hawaii, I always I always text Daniel, and then he always happens to be in LA when I'm in Hawaii. But that's beside the point. But it's fine. <laughs> what are the chances of that? Huh. No, but when you walk around your house anyway, when you, when you walk around Honolulu, are you are you like the king of Hawaii? Do they? Do are, I mean you? It must be people must just run screaming they can't believe they're seeing i mean uh two of their beloved characters at once in the same person at nobu <laughs> you know what's funny is like it's evolved actually since so when loss first happened i was getting people like we were all the whole cast was getting people like screaming and like dropping food and all that kind of stuff you know uh but the longer i've lived here the more kind of relaxed it's become and it's pretty much now when I go out it's understood that um, people know who I am and so now people come up to me and say things like I'm their neighbor you know and so oh. people come up to me and say hey yeah good to see you again I saw you like three weeks ago at such and such a place and I'll, I'll really have no idea whether they're actual friends of mine <laughs> <laughs> that I've never seen before <laughs> so I, I find myself being nice to everybody, which is, you know, how it should be anyway. But yeah, yeah. But yeah. Do you, ever, do you ever just for an ego stroke, like, I think I'll walk down Waikiki today. I think I'm just going <laughs> to take a little stroll and see what happens. Now, it it just actually, sounds like a nightmare, actually. Like, just to think <laughs> about you, you and knowing Ken you, Daniel. Walk like, down Waikiki <laughs> in Speedos, just talk. <laughs> Just well, talking about just future. talking about the last dance documentary. Hey man, what'd you think of Pippin? Do you think he has a right to be upset? <laughs> yeah, I do. And then we're walking in Speedos. One side is like amazing, like, you know, thirsty. They're like thirsty women watching. The other the other are women like vomiting, like watching. So you got thirst, a combination of thirst and vomit, you know, while we're on Waikiki. So I, like Saturday night. <laughs> Saturday. Look, uh, if you'd so, allow me, I'd like to shoot the documentary called Daniel and Ken take a walk and I'll just ha just film it like a Saturday afternoon. I'll pay you each very well. Ken, I can totally get someone to decorate your home and <laughs> that would be that sort of money. And <laughs> Ken and I have the same decorator. So yeah, that's what I just said. I said that sentence out loud. I know. Uh, <laughs> is, it, 
Is that the most LA thing to say? Uh, yeah. I, think that's, I think his comments like that is why Daniel moved to Hawaii. I don't blame <laughs> him. Because, it's because such an LA thing to say. Oh yeah, I know Joe McHale. We have the same decorator. <laughs> I will do. I will do. Ken and Daniel take a walk in Hawaii as long as we can do then. Ken and Daniel take a walk in the deep south right after. Oh, that. I'll do that. <laughs> That would be that would be fun to do. Oh. That would. <laughs> yeah. Okay. We'll walk along the Alabama shore. It'll be great. Yeah, you know, hang out with all the teens, uh, partying in Georgia. Oh. Yeah, man. Yeah, but you're. Just... Wait, are you technical? So for we haven't even mentioned it that uh, that if, for those of you that don't know this, Daniel got COVID uh back in February. In March. Oh, in March and uh. And he, your Instagram post is beautiful and wonderful, and he, uh, and uh, and some we can. I would love to talk about that, but yeah, he got the virus, and he thankfully, as you can see, because it still looks like Ken has it as we speak. <laughs> but uh, I never got infected. I never got infected. It's well, weird. Uh, He's so I never healthy. Got infected. No, 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 it doesn't I, make I, any sense. No, no, no. I never got infected. It no. is like a before and after picture. That's what no, scares no. Again, me. Again, just to uh, clear. Just you know, just a fact check right now. I'm calling never racist got, on that myself. No, 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 never uh, got infected. Never got infected. But, but yeah. no, but you, 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 you recovered. I forgot even my point. Uh, but uh, I think we maybe should start talking about. But your, uh, and let's go to the Instagram post where, uh, obviously, like so I, uh, which you were, which you said, which was you know, Asian Americans are getting. Uh, a, a really bad uh, turn rap here from Americans, their own their own countrymen. Uh, and I like I cut my head open right as this was all hitting. And I went to the uh, urgent care and I said and it was right. It was happening. I'm like, how many people are calling with this covid thing? And they were like, can't put the phone down. And then I and they said, you wouldn't believe how many people when they walk in said, don't worry, I'm not buying Corona beer and I'm not getting Chinese food. And I was just like, how many? They were like, way more than it you'd think. And the doctor was pissed and the nurse was pissed. And I was just like, that fucking, I love this country so much. And I fucking, it just drives me out of my mind. It makes me want to throw furniture out the window. Uh, and uh, but, but you have been the poster child of this. You've been, I mean, you've been, you, you've been kind of the tip of the spear on it. Uh, and and Ken's been the back of the spear that rests on the ground. Again and again, the spear never got infected. Kind of rests against because you want to keep the sharp again. end sharp. You know, like a pool cue. You don't want to mess up the tip. Anyway, again. Uh, so, but I just, I guess I want to say, like, uh, uh, I read your New York Times article where you also you voiced that PBS documentary about Asian American. Uh, Asian Americans and the history of it. Uh, and it's just, uh, I just, you, look, we, Ken and I, I'm just going to stop talking a second, but Ken and I do silly things for a living. But that stuff is so important. And uh, so I can't, I'm going to burst out crying. But because uh, I still want to ask you about what it was like to have COVID. Uh, so anyway, uh, thanks. See you later. You're welcome. <laughs> I, 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 no, I just introduced you on an award show. Th you know, this, is the mo this is the most human I've not only seen Joe McHale on the podcast, but this is the most human I've ever seen and empathetic I've seen Joe McHale ever, ever. <laughs> so yeah. these it kind all... of words that come from Joe McHale are few. And far between. And oddly enough, I a thousand percent agree with Joel because a just as my friend, I'm just so glad that you're better. I mean, that 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 was just the most uh, oh man, you know, uh, man, when I heard about it and then and when we were texting, I didn't even want to call you just in case you're just just not feeling well. And it was just all these things. I was just, you know, I, I, I was just uh, mortified. And then uh, and then when you got better and then to you really were just such a role model even as a as a patient you detailed everything that you went through and i think you gave so much i don't know you 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 shone you shone a, a light on what what it's like to go through it uh, as an asian american going through it and and um it it it, it again you just continue to inspire man and i'm just um but more important than that i'm just glad you're okay Daniel, because... i blame new amsterdam that's what i blame, <laughs> oh, yeah. I blame the show nbc's <laughs> hit hospital drama new amsterdam. No, did new you amsterdam. when you got covid and you're working on new amsterdam did you scream the irony at any point 
<laughs> well, you know, it was funny that we were working in hospitals everywhere in Brooklyn that turned out to be like serious hotspots as, you know, the pandemic kind of grew. But, uh, you know, first, let me say thank you guys for all of that. Very unnecessary. And I'm actually, I'm really glad, I'm, I'm really glad you guys even watched those, uh, the, 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 the videos and read the articles and all that stuff. That's, um, that's touching. I never expect that kind of stuff. And I wish more people would, would learn about our own history, regardless of what race you are, you know, but, um, it's precisely what you're talking about, Joel, is why I decided to do the videos. Like when you have people who don't want to drink Corona beer or think that all Chinese people carry the virus, this kind of misinformation, especially in the early days of the virus, was kind was everywhere. People didn't know Americans didn't know of other Americans who'd had the, the virus at the time, and so, um, you know, because I'd had it early, I thought this might be a good chance to kind of just share the experience, and you know, at least someone can then say, well, I know this person is going through it. This is what he's going through. It may not be what everyone is going through, but at least now I have a point of reference, you know, and because there was so much misinformation and, and a, just a general lack of information, which we could go down the rabbit hole all night long about, uh, I just really did want to kind of share an experience, shine a light, and, and really just kind of say, like, if, if you find this stuff informative and if it helps you either cope with your own um, sickness or uh, it can, if it can help prevent sickness, then, you know, then hopefully that's helpful. And that was kind of the spirit with which I you know, posted those videos, but it was a weird thing because it was amazing how political the videos got and the responses, the, how politicized things were. And, mm -hmm. you know, uh, it, you know, I don't, maybe we want to talk about politics. Maybe we don't, I'll leave it up to you guys. Oh, we can talk about whatever you want to talk we're, about, we're, brother. We're, Trust we're, me. You just, I, you've been seeing my posts on Instagram, right? So yeah, you know, I, and, just, and, I just, you know, it, it, it's really not even a political thing to me. It's a, uh, to me, it's a medical thing. To me, it's a science thing. To yeah. me, it's a it's a life or death thing. It's no there's no politics involved when it comes to me. It's just to me, I'm, you know, this is an area that is near and dear to my heart, which is medicine. And when you're just seeing so many mistakes being made, you know, you know, it it's how can I not call truth to power on something mm -hmm. that if I don't know any, if I don't know as much about my wife knows twice as much as me, and and we That's both every subject. Yeah, that's every subject, <laughs> including comedy. But that's every subject, and it, but it really is. Um, to me, it's just you, you, we. All my life is just always about embracing the science and making decisions from there. You know, so well, that's the way I felt, and so that's why I wanted to share my viewpoint from a science kind of based perspective. And yeah. you know, when I share the my drug protocol, I just wanted to let people know and let people know that this isn't for everybody, and and you know this may not have been an FDA approved protocol, but this is what helped me. And so, amazingly, like, and 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 for the record. I started taking this drug, hydroxychloroquine, before the president ever talked about it, um, and and so I had already been on it when it when the president talked about it, and then it became a political football, and so right th that was you know it was shocking to me how the fact that I took something became a, an issue for the left or the right, and not just an issue uh, of of human. The health. Yeah, and health. Right. Well, it's so, funny, you know, early articles where, like me and Tran, my wife, we would just uh, trade articles that we, we would read on the internet. And and then, you know, we both have friends who are actively on the front line practicing. So there were, there were the only studies that we had at that time in early March, they're coming out of China, uh, South Korea, um, mm -hmm. Italy. And there was a study in South Korea showing you know, um, that anti-malarials were being used as empiric therapy, you know, for, for protocols. And when you're talking about carriers of zinc and, you know, that allows to go into the bloodstream exactly. to disrupt the virus. Mm -hmm. So there is something there that, um, hydroxychloroquine theoretically can carry the zinc into the bloodstream that zinc can help disrupt the the DNA the protein structure to spike proteins of, of the virus and then um, and then also for some reason maybe hydroxychloroquine itself it was really chloroquine and then hydroxychloroquine you know is a is a bit newer drug on the spectrum even though both have been around for decades I think that I think what to me um, what 
the problem with high, the, where everything's being weaponized, uh, that drug is was the delivery system. If POTUS had described hydroxychloroquine like you did in your video, saying it's not for everybody, you know, consult your doctor to see if this is even appropriate because it is rife with side effects particularly in patients who you know may have heart problems and cardiac problems who aren't who are older and can did you, you see that you, the who just suspended tests on yeah, it or something they suspended it yeah, yeah they, they suspended it so i i think the problem is you need and it starts at the top you need if you don't know it's actually okay to say i don't know I don't know if, the, in other words, I don't know if this is appropriate for you. Here's what was given to me. It wasn't like I asked for it, you know. Well, here's what was given to me, and then, and then go from there. But it was his delivery system. He literally talked like a, a bully in an after-school special. Just take it. Just take it. It won't harm you. Just take it. You know, just said it like that. Like it was like. Take it, you precious. You know, it was like, come on, man. You don't, you don't say it like that. You say, this was what was prescribed to me, along with several other medications. That's this right. is what this is a clinical course that had happened. Again, this may, I mean, the way, and and I and and we talked about this. The way you described your symptomatology, your treatment regimen, you did it perfectly. You did it better than. You literally did it better than the leader of the free world, and you you did it better. That's not saying much, but you you did it better than anybody. You did it better than I did, than I would. You 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 spelled it out very meticulously, and you really, you know, crossed your t's and dotted your i's. And I loved every second of it. It was very inspiring, and and to me. The take home point to me wasn't like, oh, what what Daniel took is what I'm, you know, that's my, you know, that's my that's my soup that I'm gonna take. No, it's just like, hey, this is thanks I for the shout that, out. <laughs> yeah, thank no problem. I just did that for you. And then, but it's just more the, it, you know, we're no, I mean, we don't know anything about, especially at that time, the medicine will evolve, the drugs will evolve, and and things will. There will be pivots involved. Involved, so it 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 just saddens me that you, even if you're not a doctor, you can just say, "Hey, whatever you do, talk to your doctor first. That's all you have to say." Yeah, you know, like I'm talking about, like Trump. I mean, that's all you have to say is just whatever you do, talk to your doctor first. This is what was given to me, yeah. and then just and then if he had said that. It would have gone like there wouldn't be an issue whatsoever about anything. So it's about trust, goodwill. It's about develop, you know, building that trust between the physician and the patient. You know, and and in this case, he is almost like the medical administrator. You know, I've had many medical directors where I worked, and they would always say, "Hey, you know, consult your doctor for the appropriate treatment regimen." He, a medical director, is not going to tell me exactly what to prescribe, especially if that person's not a doctor. So. Right. Again, but you got sued so often for malpractice. Again, I didn't leave. Maybe it was they my choice. actually yeah, no, I wasn't did disbarred. tell you what to wasn't, prescribe. No, I wasn't fired. I mean, you um, I, had I to chose, turn to acting, which is not necessarily. I, I, I mean, I just feel like you know, yeah, go through this all the time, Daniel. No, I not disbarred. <laughs> you can't disbar a doctor. That's that's just not. You just can't do that. You can't disbar a doctor. No, you can't. No, you can't. That's the law. You know, no, we didn't oh. take disbar. No, 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 you can't. Daniel, when you got it, was it how bad was it? So for, for me, like, it wasn't as bad as many others, because obviously I'm alive, but also I never had to go to a hospital. Um, because, because I was in New York, and because I know my body pretty well, and I know, like, when I get the flu, the kind of symptoms I usually get, and the symptoms I was feeling when I started getting this were not like the any flu that I've had. Like, I the first symptom I had was... Like I felt like there was fiberglass in my throat. I felt like there were shards of glass in my throat. Did you and think it was like strep throat? No. At that point, I, I, but I it was that it was different than strep throat. Yeah, I mean, for me, like as I, you know, I had I had strep throat when I was uh, younger once, but this was like immediate. It wasn't like strep kind of comes on like right. slowly and and it's gradual, but this was immediate, and I thought. Something's different here. So as soon as that happened, I started talking to my doctor. And then 
Um, and and right there is 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 a point at which I realize I have some privilege because I had a doctor to talk to. I could call mm. someone and say, "This is what I'm feeling," and not many people are able to do that. And which is which is where the problem one one way the problem starts. But so I talked to my doctor, and and he just said, "Okay, monitor it. And when you if you start to feel like you're getting a fever, let me know." And then, sure enough, a few hours later, I started feeling hot. And so, literally, a few hours later. Yeah, uh, literally. And so, and, and had so, you taken Advil or anything nothing, to treat it? Anything, because I wanted to be sure that I wasn't masking any symptoms, you know. And so, uh, and so, I started. Uh, I started getting a fever, and I said, uh, I called him again, and I said, uh, "This is what I'm feeling now." And he said, "You know, you should probably get tested." And so I went to a public testing site the next day, and because it hadn't hit Hawaii so severely yet, um, I was just able to roll up to a testing site, and I got tested without much of a wait. Um, and, and again, that's also very different from the experience that many Americans have had trying to get tests. Yeah. And I think, and I and I recognize that also. So, in, in were I, you terrified at that point, or were you? What was the? Were you fearful, or were you like, I'm gonna? This is okay, or I think I'll be. What was, was your what was going I, through your brain? I wasn't terrified. And here here's why. Because when I was in New York working on New Amsterdam, the uh, Which caused it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> just gonna oh, blame oh, the show. I don't know why I'm going after this television. Why are you know, blaming a show, Joel? Just uh, I don't know, I just thought I'd see what would happen. But the, but the medical advisor for New Amsterdam is the head of emergency medicine at Bellevue Hospital in New York. Oh. And so Jeez. as it was starting to progress, you know, just the day before, you know, I had had a long conversation with him about what to expect and what he thought about, you know, how the pandemic would progress. And so I had a lot of information before I ever got the disease. And so I, I, I was lucky enough to have the opinion of several doctors right off the bat, you know, and my personal doctor had had experience uh, with the Korean treatment protocol. So this is why he knew about hydroxychloroquine and he knew to prescribe it as soon as uh, my test results came back. And so all of those things happened in a row for me that uh, that I don't think happened for many people uh, in the country. And, and that, that I recognize how fortunate I am for all of those things. And um, I think to answer your question, the result of that was that I had a mild case because my fever never spiked, you know, above 100 or 101. It was starting to get there, and then the drugs started kicking in, in my opinion. Now, and so it was a relatively mild case. Now, the recovery was several weeks, um, but that that's a whole different phase of this. The, 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 the sickness was unlike anything I'd ever had. And the recovery was unlike any recovery I, I, I'd ever had. So it was very, very odd. Um, not like, it, in some ways like the flu, but in other important ways, not at all like the flu. And I know that taste is one of the first things to go in a lot of yeah. people. And is that, well, and that and I read that that's one of the things that happened. Yeah, so for me, strangely enough, I had like the chills, the body aches, um, the, 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 the the fever, and uh, and I was in bed for like four or five days, and then I started feeling better, and that's when I actually posted, I think, my second post saying, I, I feel pretty good, and then as soon as I posted that, I, my the antibiotic regimen had, had, had finished, I stopped taking all of my meds, and I backslid almost immediately. And so the next wow. day, I started feeling terrible again, and I started feeling like uh, uh, like serious fatigue. Um, and then I started to lose my sense of smell and taste. It was only then, and so it was this weird kind of like second wave uh, of sickness. And that's why, just anecdotally, I think that the meds did make a difference. I, now I can't attribute like which med medication was more effective than the other, but I do know that once I stopped the medication, I started feeling sicker. Uh, and, and then, and then you went right now. And your did your doctor tell you to get off the medicine, or you chose to? No, I mean he prescribed a cycle. Like I had a Z-pack, and that's a five-day cycle. And then the hydroxychloroquine he prescribed for like five five days also. And so everything just ended at the same time. Uh, and so. Now, once I got off of those meds, the fever never came back, but I had other symptoms and loss of smell and taste was, was one of them.
And is it all restored now? Uh, oddly, there are two things that I still feel. Uh, one of them is that I don't feel like my sense of taste is back to where it used to be. And the other thing is, it took me a long time to be able to focus again. It took me a long time to be able to sit and read something and be able to kind of stay focused on it. I just, I couldn't. And I'd read some some articles since then that said that, you know, there has been some connection to, uh, you know, um, that, that loss of focus and COVID. So uh, in, in one article I'd read, they said that, you know, there was some kind of plaque-like su substance that is commonly associated with Alzheimer's that has shown up in COVID patients. So um, that's the, that's, I don't, I don't know how widespread that is, but that is something I definitely felt for a long time and still to a certain degree feel. And, and, and then the last thing is, you know, my stamina level, you know, I just need to kind of, I'm still working on that. I don't feel like uh, I had that same energy, but you know, I'm also, you know, quarantined and all that stuff. So not exercising as much. Do you, right. do you feel, wow. do you feel more fatigued? Does that, are there other kind of constitutional symptoms that go along with the lack of focus? Uh, just, I do find that, uh, it's not that I feel fatigued all the time. It's just that I, you know, there are, when I do feel fatigued, it's sudden and it's just, I gotta, I gotta take a break, you know, kind of a thing. And so, um, it's just those periods, those ups and downs are a little bit more extreme. Like everyone gets fatigued during the day, you know, like, and everyone needs a coffee break or whatever, but I just noticed that the, the highs are higher and the lows are lower. Hmm. And did you, when you got it, were, did you immediately go into a room in your home and said, folk, uh, wife, kids, don't just slip the food under the door. I'll be yeah. here with a laptop and my yeah. phone and that's don't just don't even, don't look at me. Yeah, no, that, you know what the crazy part is? I flew back from New York with my son and we had, we, you know, we had, he was working in New York at the time and we actually slept in the same bed for two nights before I came, before we both came back together on the same flight next to one another. And he has not gotten the virus. He, in fact, you know, they tested for antibodies for him and he's negative for antibodies. I, as you might guess, am positive. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and their explanation is just luck or we still don't know anything about this thing. We don't know. And so, uh, you know, I, I thought for a long time he was just asymptomatic, you know, and that he would test positive for the antibodies because of anyone that I had mo the most exposure to. It was him. But yeah. he's negative. And so to answer your question, as soon as I got home, first of all, my wife like disinfected me like I was, uh, you know, uh, like, like us, <laughs> like uh, Sylvester Stallone in uh, First Blood with the, yeah, exactly. with the uh, she, fire hose against the wall. My wife would not let me into the house. And she's, <laughs> my, my son and I were in the garage. She literally brought out cans of Lysol. And it was like Lysoling all of our luggage Ejected and you. our clothes and, and, and giving me wet, wipe, wet wipes and sanitizer. And it was like, before you touch anything in the house, you have you have to disinfect everything. It's I literally this is not a joke. We stripped down in our garage and took off all of our clothes where she could lice all them, and then we went straight into a shower. So uh, that's that's how it all started. And then Night I tried on a very special Hawaii Five O. <laughs> <laughs> this lady goes nuts. Takes her husband and son strip naked. <laughs> and so, Hawaii Five O is Hawaii Four O Nine spray. It's uh, <laughs> oh Ken. So Comedy what? Job. I've been waiting eight months to. I had that in the back of my That's head good. for like I've been trying to do my Hawaii Four O Nine joke for like months. No, mm -hmm. um, Dan, but I think no. Ken has that plaque you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> again, again, not infected. And I mean, that that extreme measure was probably incredibly uh, smart, uh, yeah. right? I mean, that was I don't know anybody who has. To, and that was before you were symptomatic. Yeah. And, and so, so she I, just knew you were coming from New York and she was like, you're not coming in the house. I'm going <laughs> to ruin your clothes. Get yep. get naked. I'm going <laughs> to spray you down. I mean, she probably stopped her from getting it at least, but somehow your son is obviously some sort of has some sort of super I don't know what he has some uh, super immune system, but uh, that probably 
that 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 one act probably saved a, a zillion cases in Hawaii or whatever. I mean, that's crazy. Yeah, well, she she you know she had been up to date on the news, and I'm, I'm grateful that she was uh, you know thinking that far ahead. And and so literally from that point on, as soon as we showered, um, you know, I went into a separate room, and and so did my son. And um, and we you know we have an area of our house that's kind of away from everyone else, and that in fact it's this room. Uh, and so this room that you're looking at was my my home for 14 days, and I was getting slip meals prison style under the door, and you know, <laughs> it was wow. it was uh, it wasn't easy. And uh, you know, literally, like I, this is a guest room in our house, and so I've spent I spend very little time here through the time we've owned this house, but now it feels like my room. <laughs> <laughs> so. And does your wife ever go go to your room? Uh, I don't feel safe. <laughs> She was no, like, she said, you know, you need to set up an office, so you might as well use the guest room. <laughs> she wasn't, she wasn't like hosing you and your son down every day or anything. You're like, this is getting burial. <laughs> so then, how warm water at least? <laughs> you could turn on the warm. How long after you got home to showing to before fiberglass throat? How long was that period? I started feeling fiberglass throat as I was landing in Hawaii. Holy Lord. So as I was landing. And so, you know, um, uh, so is it a that, direct flight from New York to Hawaii. Yeah. The one I took was direct. And so, uh, I started, that's when I started feeling, it. I called my doctor literally, um, you know, that night and when I landed and then by the next morning, uh, you know, we were talking about getting a test. And so it was, I guess, three days after that, um, that I got my test results back and, you know, uh, I started the, the, the medication. I, th I just think that, um, wow. man, I'm, I'm, man, it's just, this it's, is the it's, best. You, it's this hard is... for me. I'm so glad you're, 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 you know, asking these questions, brother. Cause I just, it's, Man, I, it just uh, it, it's just so hard to, you know, hear it from a good friend going through going through this because as a physician you can you can try to be as objectively Warmer. you know, Go ahead. yeah as for a physician you can you can just be as objective and it's just oh man it's just it just hurts me to my core to see you go through this and I the only thing I can just think intuitively is just like thank God you had the presence of mind you know for you, you caught it early brother. You caught it early, you know, you know who, who knows when, you know, who knows exactly when that happened. You know, they always say like, oh, it can be four or five days. And if you have this asymptomatic, pre-symptomatic phase, but I think you caught it as early as humanly possible. And, and, uh, and, and for that, I'm just so, you know, just, uh, any, any patient, anyone listening out there, if, if you have, if you if you have a fever, if you're having, you know, these symptoms that are completely, you know, just different from a normal cold or flu, it's early. It's just it's just getting that being hyper vigilant, and that's what I would say to every patient: just for you to be hyper vigilant, and 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 it's not only having the resources, but it's not just that, Daniel. It's like you got in front of it. You, you your knowledge was your your power. Your knowledge. That's was, it. Your knowledge was your wealth. Yeah. It was not, you know, it it's. You know, because I, I, I am aware, like, oh, if, if people will say, um, you know, certain VIPs may have certain access, you can have all the access you, you, you have in the world. But if you don't have the knowledge to go through that, mm -hmm. and you did, um, all all the tools and resources you have are useless. So the fact that you got out there and, and just figured it out, because even if you didn't have access to your physician, knowing you – you would go next door, next day to a clinic and to a physician, to a walk-in clinic, and then ask them, "Hey, I think I have this. What do you think?" They would got you got a test that day. You know. Well, that, I will say I will say that because you know I am very fortunate to have a physician that I I really like and trust. Yeah. Um, uh, but even if I didn't know him, I would have sought out where to get a, a exactly. test. And, yeah. and in Hawaii, yeah. thankfully, there were tests to be had, and so. Um, you know, as far as people talking about celebrity special treatment, I went to a public testing place and, and yeah. waited like yes. everybody else. This was not yeah. a private lab that I was going to. And so, right. you know, I just knew that 
A, this wasn't the way I get sick. B, I was coming from New York City. And C, I just had conversations with these doctors who were talking about this pandemic. And I thought, you know, this is um, a, a lot of risk factors are involved here. It might be worthwhile for me to check it out. And, and I think, it, yeah, I think Joe Russo pointed it out in a, a podcast I'd like to advertise right now. But uh, that if you like you just like the more knowledge you get about this thing or about anything, but if, about this thing, the, your anxiety will actually go down if you're worried. It won't make you more freaked out. It'll make you go, oh, here's a way to proceed and here's a way to have there's a plan that is in place and you can pursue that thing. And you obviously had the knowledge and were on top of it like a Navy SEAL. Uh, and it, it was, it's very impressive. And, uh, that you, you did that. Cause I, i I imagine if that happens to me, I'm going to be like, Hey, fever sucks. And, uh, <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> I will I'll let like six days go and they'll be like, boy, this lasagna is terrible. And I'll be like, I can't taste it. I was like, maybe you should go do the thing. And, <laughs> <laughs> but you know what I will say that that, that I, I completely agree with both of you guys on is first and foremost I was trusting the doctors <laughs> I was trusting the trusting people science yeah trusting science I and I was aware of and listening to all the briefings every day and they just confused the hell out of me and so you know it, it seemed like a circus sideshow and I really appreciated your particular post Ken where you put the the theme from Cur Curb Your Enthusiasm uh, over about <laughs> something in a briefing uh, yeah. that to this day my favorite post of the entire crisis and uh, but it's because it perfectly summed it up, you know, and and I was just calling and talking to doctors and reading, you know, medical uh, articles written by uh, medical people, and so that was that was what I was trusting far and away beyond every everything else. Yeah, I mean, if any, if there's any point to be gained out of all this, it it, it really isn't listening to the symptomatology of what Daniel Day Kim is saying right now, anyone who's worried about having COVID-19 listening to this right now, the take-home point of this whole exercise is to call your doctor, is see what applies to you. It's, it's like you've heard these cases, you, you've read about cases, we're talking to someone who is who has survived it, who went through it, just talk to your doctor. You know, it's like... That 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 is, or and if you can't find that doctor, go to another doctor that you can talk to. And to me, now that we have the benefit of more testing, and 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 there's more, and and everyone's more incentivized for testing, antibody testing, contact tracing. You know, we have more resources than ever. It's it's just if the problem right now with. This country is that everyone is looking for information like, oh, l l let me get it from this news source. Let me get it from this news source. No, talk to your doctor. Yeah. All right. They will help filter That's this out for point, you. Yeah. You know, it, 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 it drives me nuts because even if I'm, I'm watching something on the news, yes, and emotionally I'll get triggered. I'm like, this sucks. I'll run it by Tran. Even before tonight, I was like, I literally was like, any any COVID nineteen updates that I don't know about, anything that you read, and we, you know, I cross reference everything that I find out with Tran every day, you know, just to make sure I'm not going off the beaten path. And then I'll call other doctor friends of mine on the front line. Is like, hey, this is what I've heard in the news. This is what run on my. What's your opinion on this? So, it now that we actually have more information. It, 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 there's no excuse. There's no excuse to to just talk to a physician and talk to talk to a healthcare professional because the you know. And on the flip side of that, you know, take with a grain of salt the things that your politicians are saying because they are not doctors. And you know, and and so it's it's not just about trusting your doctors. It's about you know maybe questioning the things that you're hearing because. On any given day, you're going to be hearing contradictory information uh, from the, to the day before. So, you know, it, there's a lot of crosstalk and a lot of echo chambers going on right now. Like, if, yeah. if you're getting your news from Twitter and, you know, it's only from the people you follow, you're going to get a very biased view of medicine and the treatment, the treatments you could have and, and the disease in general. So um, that's that's the thing. Like, for me, like watching watching it's been really difficult to watch our leadership handle all of this but and at the, but at the same time to get tweets 
from supporters of our president used, holding me up as a poster child for hydroxychloroquine has been like the, the biggest of ironies, you know, because it's it's not something I made, did as a political statement. I just did it because my doctor prescribed it. And, and you know, it's one of the things that may have helped me get well. I mean, yeah. people are scared. People on either people on every side of the coin. People were Republicans, Democrats, and everyone in between. It, everyone's just scared right now, and 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 they're they're worried about their health. So they're looking for leadership, and it's to me. Everyone's I don't, scared I, except I, for that that Lake of the Ozarks folks. They seem fine. But well, I, they'll, they'll I, be fine, I'm sure. <laughs> I mean, I, I think there is a willful ignorance or a denial. It's but to me, I even I even can as you know emotionally upset as I get at seeing that. It's to me it, to me it's a Kubler Ross stage of, uh, of of grief right now, and, and and there's just a lot of denial going on. I'm young, I can handle this. It's it's a willful it's a willful denial, and it's still a form of reacting to the stress. And I don't blame anyone for feeling what they feel. People need to look to a leader. And that leader should say, defer to the science, go to the data. And when you have literally in the same press conference, um, CDC, NIH giving you, telling you, don't always wear a mask. And then for Trump to say, I never wear a mask. I get tested every day. You know, to me, if that is confusing to a physician right now, is like what the fuck is going on? I can only think what is it, what's the general public thinking right now? Well, this is our leader. We're supposed to follow what our leader says. Yeah. You know, if you look at if you if you look at if you look at like there's a now this post I on Twitter I just saw, I just and he, saw. the guy was just like, hey, if the president's not wearing a mask, yeah. I'm not wearing a mask. So 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 to me, that's malpractice. That's what that shit is. That is like medical malpractice, and that is why. I'm so angered by that because at the very least, if you don't know something, say talk to your doctor. You, you, you can't go wrong with that. And there is optimism ahead in terms of you know, fast tracking a vaccine. There, there are treatments that are being – that are evolving. There will be better treatments than the treatments that they'll have now. So, so yeah. science is catching up at an exponential rate. I, I swear to God, if I was Trump right now, if I was any leader right now, I would just talk about the vaccine, how this is being fast tracked at a remarkable rate. To have a vaccine in 12 to 18 months in in a situation that will take five, that's extraordinarily fast. And then to have something that if you can get by the end of the year, you know, that to me, I can agree on. At least I can I can agree with that approach, you know, because that's the only way you're going to reopen the economy is to get – everyone immune, at least 70% of this population immune, which is herd immunity, and then you can safely reopen the economy. Yeah. And the only way you can do that is with an effective vaccine. So to me, there's a there are good things that are actually happening. Lean on that. Do your job. Now, if you want to, if you want to get reelected, do your job. You, 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 you don't pivot. You've run out of moves. Don't the the abdication of responsibility is not leadership, and uh, that is that that is that is a central issue right now. Um, mm -hmm. Let but if you take politics out of it, though, let's just talk about talk about the pandemic, the disease itself, for a second. The idea through all of this quarantining and all of the stay at home was to try and get it to a point where we eradicate the virus altogether, right? Because we have no virus, and so. We shut down the economy. Everyone's been living at home just because they want to stop the transmission. And those who have it, they want to, to they want those people to get better, to build up antibodies, and so they don't give it to other people. But if you have, if you have a, a sink that has, a, a, you know, a, a sieve for a drain, you, and you have states in this country that that aren't doing their part to eradicate the virus, well, others are. Then what difference does it make? if we're all locked down because as soon as we come back out the virus still exists it's not been eradicated and it's going to just be transmitted all over again so really then the question is why did we do all this what did we do all this for if if we're primed for a resurgence and the reliance on a vaccine i think is really important at the same time we don't know what the mutation rate of this virus is so if we're developing a vaccine that that ends up being useless because the virus is mutated then what you know and so 
all of these are questions that 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 you know I, I think about all the time because I have a son who's about to go to college and you know his senior year of high school has been completely ruined by this and now he's his freshman year of college is is, is probably going to be affected as well and he's going to New York City for college and so like as a parent I worry about him and as a citizen I wonder like if these people in the Ozarks and these these kids in Georgia and Florida are, are, are all running around you know they're going to be there's no way to stop them from going interstate so they're going to be going all over the country again um, and if you look at what happened in Korea recently with the the outbreak when uh, in the nightclub yeah at the nightclub yeah they have the Ken was DJing tracking system that the, the, their methodology is second to none in the world and I can speak from experience because I actually went to Korea and 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 and, and, and saw what they were doing but even wow. with them tracking, they track every single person in their country, including visitors. You have to download an app that gives the government your whereabouts. It would never fly in the United States for many reasons. But because of that, they can not only find out where that person was exactly at that nightclub at the time of the outbreak, they can contact trace everybody in that nightclub instantaneously, along with everybody, everyone that those people came into contact with. That is the most effective way of tracking down the pathway of contagion and yet they still had they had 40 new cases today and even with all of that they can't they can't keep it in check and so imagine what will happen to us given the lack of measures that we have in this country it's it's a uh, it's daunting to me no and and um it's funny right before I, right before we got on the podcast yeah tran and i were discussing that i do think that from what we've read, again, you know, uh, you know, we're, I, I read some articles and, and so a lot of this is just, again, secondhand knowledge, but I think the 40 cases were related to the nightclub. I think those are ones that, that, that came up positive. I know there, there, there's a, just a big concern right now because the schools in Korea are being reopened right now. And so they're trying to attribute that as, to my knowledge, that's not directly so, but I think that to your point, Korea has handled this better um, than any other country, and yeah. and really, they were but Ken, also. If you think about, if, but if you think about those forty cases, and it's a nightclub. If it's forty cases in that nightclub, twenty of them were douchebags. So, I mean, it's a nightclub, right? <laughs> so, uh, I mean, you know that those dudes walked out in some horrible shirt. So, yeah. I think. You know, yeah, it, like it doesn't. Guys. It doesn't just need to be disinfected. It needs to be destroyed. So <laughs> I get it. No, sorry, but, Ken, I but, derailed uh, that with us. But, but no, joke. I mean, I, I think that with um, Korea had also the benefit of kind of being better prepared. Right. I wouldn't say the benefit, but because what they went through with SARS, MERS, you know, with its with its cousins of the virus, you know, it, it's. It's accepted practice to wear a mask everywhere. It's accepted right. practice to and, – and, and their pandemic department, which exists unlike this country, is was a, able to get in front of it and really just – Man, they tested, 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 tested all the drive through testing, tested, tested, tested. So they get all their data and their information. And, man, I mean – You guys you want know, to hear the story? You guys yeah. want to yes. that will scare Please. you if you have time. I'm, yeah. I'm, I've never, Dude, I've never you, shared this story publicly. Getting this, this podcast goes on for we, – we don't stop. You're going to be <laughs> – you'll see. But okay, no, so please, go ahead. I'm going to tell you – I'm going to call this story a tale of two countries, okay? So when you go into Korea during this, uh, this pandemic, the first thing that happens as soon as you get off the plane is you have uh, – you're cordoned off into sections – based on who is a national, who is a visitor, and what purpose they're there for. You were given a lanyard, and then you were literally directed into a certain area of the airport. Everyone, before uh, everyone proceeds to a temperature checking portal where everyone has to walk through these like, um, they kind of look like metal detectors, and they, mm -hmm. they, they check your everyone's temperature as they go through. And then at that point, what they do is they take the foreign visitors, the people who would have to quarantine, they, they take them to a separate part of the airport, they bring a sanitized bus that has been completely wiped down, uh, and they put those visitors in that bus. They are then bused to a hotel 
that is uh, closer to the, the, the middle of the city. The hotel is, has also been completely sanitized and every person is directed to a hotel room uh, in that hotel. Every person that they talk to is wearing a hazmat suit and when you go into that room, uh, you register for a COVID test, okay? And so uh, you, you, the reason why you go into that room is because you are, you are to be tested. And so outside the room is an orange biohazard waste bag. And in that bag contains uh, a towel, uh, it contains uh, uh, toilet paper, it contains water, and it contains a bowl of instant ramen because, you know, it is Korea. And so, uh, and so everything in that bag is what you are supposed to uh, use while you're in that hotel room. In the hotel room, there are no bed sheets. There is nothing other than the essentials. There's a mattress, there, there's a chair, and, and there's that desk that's built in there. Can and, you describe the mini bar? <laughs> <laughs> I wish. I wish. So, so you go in there, and you and and then people in hazmat suits come in and give you a COVID test. And you wait in that room for the results and you drink your water, you use the bathroom, you do whatever, and you just wait. And if you're, if you're there long enough, if you get food slipped to you uh, at your door and they knock. And so they give you food while, while you get your results back. And everything you touch in that room is then supposed to go into that orange bag to be destroyed, not just sanitized destroyed like so th and then once that COVID test comes back then and only then are you allowed into the population and that's if you're lucky enough not to be quarantined somewhere else some people are quarantined for 14 days after they get the COVID test so this is how Korea is doing it their methodology is to test everybody and, oh and the other part of this is that as soon as you enter you are obligated to uh, download an app uh, called the COVID app for Korea. And every 24 hours, you are required to answer questions about your physical health, and yes or no questions, and then submit the app, or like click yes on the app to submit your information to the COVID testing center. And if you fail to do so, you will be found. And so uh, this is what they're doing. Now, contrast this. When I got back from Korea, I flew into LAX, okay? Have you, you guys have all flown into Tom Bradley. You know, like, what a zoo that place can be. When I got into Tom Bradley, I got off the plane, and the, the time it took me to get off the plane to literally out, out of the terminal was 10 minutes. 10 minutes. That's with bags and everything. There was not a single question about where I was coming from. There was not a single question about COVID. There was not anyone stopping me for a temperature check. My bags came out almost immediately because the plane was half empty and uh, there weren't many flights coming in. So I was literally in and out of there, the quickest I've ever been in and out of Tom Bradley. Contrast that with the experience in Korea. And this is only you know, that's the same time period. So how, how are we going to prevent the transmission of this disease from any international traveler if we don't have a plan in place, let alone the people in our own country? Yeah, it's just, it, and it's just not just saying, oh, it's the states or it's just the government or it's just the airport. Lead, lead, dude. It's just lead because we need guidelines in place we need to enable the CDC, we need to enable the NIH, and we need to have some coordinated system in place. There's so many studies going on right now. If you don't have a coordinated reopening, there will be a second wave, and it, the cases will spike, and there is, a, there is a chance, a good chance, there could be another shelter at home, you know, so there would be another stay at home, you know. So, you know, it, it, and it's that's just the thing that I, I mean, as, as Daniel said, like, the thing that I don't, and this is not, I mean, it, what, what I don't get is the it's up to the state how they want to handle it because if you're on a ship and they say batten down the hatches and each room oh and each room gets to choose whether they want to close their hatch or not if one hatch is open that's all right. the water's getting in so that's when i go like because arizona obviously is way more open than than california and texas is open uh, and so that's when I go, how is that going to, as, as Daniel was saying, I was just like, 
well, what's the point of all this if a couple of people from wherever show back up and like, and then we're off to the races again with, with, with cases spiking and us, us sheltering again and my kids going like, well, I guess I'll play some more Fortnite and uh, at a, with, uh, because they're, they're not going to be hitting the streets. And so I, that's when I go, what's going on here? Why is there not a large uh, central effort, the, our coordinated effort from the top that goes, these are the rules. And so uh, it, that's, that's what and I, and, and, and I, and I, I confused by it. And so. It, and I will it, say it, this, like in America's defense, you know, Korea is a country the size of Pennsylvania. Right now we have, you know, 50 states, <laughs> you know, uh, 50 right. Korea trying but to marshal. Korea's population is enormous and it's got a bigger, it doesn't have a, it has a bigger economy. Which than is Russia. a bigger argument, which is why we need coordination because, because, you know, you have places, you know, like New York, but you also have places that like Montana where it's not, not as, you know, not as populated. So we need some coordination, at least some guidelines, you know, I think that's, that's I mean, that's all you can do is to give recommendations. So, and mm-hmm. I haven't even touched about it and I would be remiss if we weren't talking about the fucking racism that is going on against Asian Americans in this country that it just angers me and and for anyone who wants to know why i responded the way i did on instagram when trump the other day said as some people like to call it the china virus and i did the chow jizz sign it's because you're dog whistling right now i know what you're doing and then if you're not dog whistling to racists you're doubling down because you refuse to pivot and you know what? There, there are being lives lost. There are being Asian Americans put at risk in harm's way, and it is just like stop, just fucking stop. And it, uh, people don't under some people don't understand. Even Bill Maher doesn't understand. Hey, hey, if it happened in Milan, we will call it the Milan virus, dude. Dude, that is a false equivalency. You don't know what the fuck you're talking about. But you here's the other thing, though. Like, it wouldn't matter. Like, if this were called the John virus and everyone named John started getting beaten on the streets, that would be equally wrong. The fact is that people, for whatever reason, cannot distinguish between the government of China or, you know, Chinese people and Asian Americans, not just Chinese Americans, mm. but any mm. Asian American. And, and this is the thing that is ridiculous to me. And like, you can make the argument that, yes, we can call it the Chinese virus because it's originated in China. But if that, if that, if by calling it that incites violence against a group of people, then why wouldn't you stop? Why? You know, and like, that's what mo- that's what mainstream media did when they found that there was an increase in incidents against violence against Asian Americans, and that's when Trump decided to use it more. That's yeah. when he decided to use it more. And so, when you so see- for me, th- th- this gets me as not only as a physician but also as an Asian American with a family who's also Asian American. It's just it's just like it's a double whammy for my yeah. people. Yeah. And when you see that it's not written as the China virus in his notes. And he literally crosses out COVID-19 and writes over that, you know, that it's a China virus. There's nothing accidental about that. It is completely deliberate. And, and, and he knows he knows what he's doing. And th- this is the most insidious mm-hmm. part of it. And I granted, I, I will say this, you know, the relation there's a very there's a, a level of international relations that goes on between our leaders that we know nothing about and there might be some jockeying and some gamesmanship and some and uh, uh, between the two of them you know that that we are not privy to but the fact regardless of whether it's about that or something else the side effects are that people are getting hurt people are getting injured and and I, you know I'm surprised that no one's been killed you know but some yeah. of the things some of these things, and it's not, and this is an important point too, it's not just about Asian Americans, it's about the disintegration of race relations in America in general. You know, Ahmad Arbery, Everything's look, getting exposed right now yeah, with the pandemic. At, everything, everything bad is being exposed. You so know. it's everyone against everyone else, and this is ridiculous, and this is a form of leadership that has also been abdicated. A leader needs to unite and not promote divisiveness. And I don't see any of that coming from our president. 
It's just no, uh, the yeah, only reason why I'm even saying this now because you know me, Daniel. Like, dude, I've had talks with Andrew Yang about this. Like, I'm not a political guy. I don't do, but you know, I don't. I don't do. I don't like to talk about. Everyone has a right to believe what they believe, but this is not a political thing. This is th- th- this is a. This is this is a humanity thing at this point. This is something that's affecting all of us, and regardless of race, color, creed, political affiliation, we're all being affected by this, mm-hmm. and and we need to a accept the science and b exactly what you said. We we are all being affected by this, and and we need to figure out how to move forward together. You know that that's it. So uh, you me. know because if I'm at a point right now in my life, if 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 people like you and me, Daniel, can't don't speak up, then who will? You know what I mean? If they're like, who's going to? And so it's just like we – it's up to us to like say this is bullshit. This is bullshit. And it's just like you know, certain people would like to just have me just say nothing. And I'm like, no, no. And you I, have to, and I like, can't look. Yeah, I can't live if I do nothing talking like this. You know, we're going to expose ourselves to troll the, the trolls like all over the place. Like after my posts, like I got the most hateful tweets, man, like like death threats and, you know, the racial slurs, all of it. And, uh, you know, I did not really speak openly and overtly about politics. And yet, you know, any little thing. Uh, brought out all the trolls so you know we're putting ourselves on any of us that 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 speak out like this are putting ourselves on the line well well to me to to me i i really i don't like at this point in the game it's not about what other people think and and regardless whether they agree or don't agree i'm i'm leading you know i'm just leading and and it's to me it's not about it's not about what people think at this point it's about what i think and and here's how – here's the best path to move forward. This is not a popularity contest of why I'm, I'm saying this or why I'm tweeting. I, I, I know there will be – there will, of course, you know, and, and, and there will be debate and there will be, there will be haters, you know. But I'm used to – I'm used to getting trolled. Look at my movies, you know. Look at how I act. So I get it. So <laughs> look at my overacting. All right. I just, can, getting can, trolled can, is every day for me. And you know, some of your up. movies – some of your movies are good. <laughs> But you know what? It is about other people, though, because it is about – it is a, a popularity contest almost literally because it's about who gets elected come November. You know what I mean? And for some you know, it's a popularity contest, not yeah, for me. It's, yeah, it's, yeah, just, but, yeah it's, it's not for me. Yeah, but, absolutely. But, but by you speaking out, by anyone speaking out, they can have an influence on other people. And, and, and look, what I've come to learn through this entire experience is that there's a segment of the population on both sides that will not be uh, moved. By anyone or anything, but it's really about that segment in the middle that really is thoughtful and wondering, you know, which way, which way am I going to go this November? And it's those people that are really important to get a message out to by speaking out the way that you're speaking out. Um, and it's that's that's the reason to speak out, not to only speak your truth to power, but in so doing. It cause other people to think about how they're living and the choices that they're making because so many people can didn't know that there was violence against Asian people going on. When I said my first post, so you you will not go through some of the comments and see I've never heard of this fake news, literally. Right. And 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 so that it, because it wasn't in their realm, they denied that it existed. And so many people believe this. So by speaking out, we're having an influence on and, and saying, maybe this is happening. Maybe I should investigate this. This could be a thing, you know, um, right. and hopefully that message is, is happening. All you have I mean, to do you know, is go to what if I if you look at Daniel's PBS special or the, the, the mini series, Look at the difference between Ellis Island and Angel Island in San Francisco, and you'll see it right there when it, that started. How different uh, people from Asia entering this country were compared to people from Europe entering this country. It starts there, and it's a uh, it was sadly systemic, and uh, it 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 tr- that stuff trickles down, and it comes down to educate yourself. And instead of going, eh, I didn't know about it, so it must not be real. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, literally, uh, we're just like crazy. And uh, I'm, I mean, these are 
I what I've walked into because I'm obsessed with uh, military surplus. Thank you. We'll talk about this at some other point, Ken, on the <laughs> podcast. But in the in the sec, there's a section in the, uh, a couple of military that I've gone into that says zombie uh, apocalypse supplies, and I was like, I said, I know the owner of one of them in Seattle, and his name is Jack, and I was like, <laughs> <laughs> hilarious. And then he was like, No, people think it's real, and I'm like. Oh, right. That's rough. And because of the popularity of zombie shows. So <laughs> just it's what go back to what you said, Ken, every week. And what you just said, it was like, follow the science, educate yourself, because I know most people have friends that are Asian and they don't get there's like you don't understand the getting here was totally different for them compared to you. So Look at that history. And that's why when you say the China virus, when some, when he says the China virus, it's different <laughs> than saying the, uh, you know, whatever Italian virus or whatever it was. Right. And so uh, what Mar said. So uh, just the perspective of history in this country, like the great experiment that America is, it, 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 it miraculously has worked uh, and that we're not all killing each other. But so much work to do. And so. And and this stuff like this exposes it greatly. And but yeah, I mean, well, thank you, Joel. I mean, you know, thank you for and 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 really just thank you. Watch Dan Daniel's too. special is what I'm saying. Watch, yeah, exactly. Yeah, watch what get, get him some more money because. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but, but seriously, I know though, you, what yeah. is what is great about that special is that it shows you that this is not the first time. It's by far not the first time, you know, throughout history. Um, not not just Asian Americans, but every outside group that has come into this country has had to prove their Americanness and has been treated like an outside group. Unfortunately for Asian Americans, um, because our appearance is not European, we are we are perpetually asked to justify our American citizenship, right. our Americanness, and that is I just don't know when that stops. Uh, it's because it hasn't up until now. I mean, I mean, to me, it just, it, it, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, for, yeah, for me, I, I, I've, I've, I've incredibly strong, you know, because everyone thinks that, I don't know, coming from a, coming from a background in education to entertainment, just my point of view of all that is just like, like, come on, man, like, like I, I, I ain't getting, I, I just. I ain't getting trolled by nobody. No, nothing affects me, man, because it's just I know who I am, good and bad. I don't need a troll telling me, you know, what my flaws are. I know what I do bad. I also know what I do good. And to me, trolls are trolls. They're just vocal minority. They're just a vocal. They live under few bridges. People. Say it again. <laughs> Say it again. They literally live under bridges. Under yeah. Nobody yeah. wants to live under a bridge. Yeah, I they... saw the cartoon. It was amazing, you know. Yeah, it was like number two on VOD under Scoob, the movie that I'm in, which was oh, number one. Here we go Take again. It. I'm Drop sorry, Daniel. Okay, um, but you went Scoob. But, I didn't know that. Oh yeah. Oh no, that is the worst. <laughs> the 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 great <laughs> oh my God, he has a major about, role uh, in Scoob. I was talking to Wahlberg. Didn't you see Turbo? <laughs> I haven't seen Scoob yet. yet. <laughs> um, no, but I, 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 to me, um, to me, I, I do feel when we're watching the news in general, like th there is, there is, you never talk about the people who are paying attention, who are conscientious, who are, you know, I have a good friend who lives in Florida right now, you know, where all the bad, you know, initially where all that stuff was happening and then where he was living in Tampa was like, there's, you know, people are more conscientious and, and cautious than people give them credit for because it's a fucking pandemic. So people, most People are going to be careful, you know, and so, you know, I, I do think that it would be nice in the news to see about people who there, there's a lot of people who are doing the right thing, who are being cautious and careful. And I, I do think that in generally because we're so saturated with with news and clickbait that that we often lose sight of it. At least I do. You know, there, there, there is there is a, a wonderful majority of us in general who are doing the right thing and, and, and doing everything they like, like, like what you're doing, Daniel is exemplary. You know, you know, if anyone listens to this, if they can just know that like this, what Daniel has gone through and how he reacted and behave, if I was to put my doctor hat on, but you know, this is the, you wore the a hat the, when you were a doctor. I wore several hats and I wore a belt cap. I wore like a Sherlock Holmes hat. 
I wore, you know, um, a Russian hat. I wore a Buckingham oh. Palace hat. Many hats, Joel. And um, what that's a, what, what's a Russian hat? A Russian hat. I just said it's just, you know, <laughs> watch the American. I don't, I don't know. know. Talk to Carrie <laughs> Russell about it. Whatever. Oh, she's you know, someone authentic. We and gotta get her on. But uh, but I think that I, I really do think that there are a lot of people out there doing a lot of good, and that doesn't get reported. And 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 Daniel, honestly, you're one of them, man. You're one of the people that you're just not only one of the good guys, you know, in the business. You're just one of the good guys in life. And uh, I'm he just, he, you know, came, he reported what was going on as it was happening, in real time. honestly, and. He was on Unsolved Mysteries in 1992. Did you know that, Ken? I did not know that. He was. Wow. Yeah. Clutch Unsolved Mysteries. Credit. Robert Stack. Unsolved. Fuck yeah. Wow. You hear me? <laughs> oh, my God. You're in a reenactment narrated by Robert Stack? Oh, Ken. I did not know. Oh, my He's God. He's our guest. He is wow. our guest. Emmy, Oscar, it doesn't matter. I was on Unsolved Mysteries. You know, after this, Joel, after we get off the phone, Dan will be like, hey, man, I know, you know, Joel was kidding, but how come you didn't know I was on mystery right. i won't I mean, even do that off the air i'm doing it right now <laughs> <laughs> way to piss the guest off way yeah, to piss the guest off you yeah we're it. going really good until you didn't okay. know my full filmography you know that that, that really gave me an entree new in the business but i, I yeah oh, but, and you're right though i will say like it, I have to balance out like all the terrible news that we get on a daily basis with like some some really positive things like like John Krasinski's some good news is amazing and uh, you know Tank's good news on Instagram is amazing now this is usually uplifting you know uh, you, you have to balance out that feed otherwise you just think you know it's the apocalypse and uh, and you know what's deemed newsworthy is the thing that is going to get get clicked on. You know? I just realized, Joel, we needed a better, brighter title. You know, it's, it's not good to call on the podcast the darkest timeline. It's just like <laughs> steeped in negativity. Yeah, well, yeah, welcome to the darkest timeline. Who gives a fuck? I'm Ken John, Joel McHale. Yeah, it's, like, maybe we should have called ate a pie tonight. For I ate a pie tonight. Pie. Fuck you. Who cares? I, I ain't fucking. I wish I had a pie. Anyway, this has been this has been the darkest timeline podcast. <laughs> but no, I mean, I really do think that um, Daniel. Has has had this ability you've had you've been the most consistent in terms of not only balancing your career but also like you said just being and, and we hate to use that phrase but being a role model for your community you've been able to pull it off like in a I way that like I did the same thing but go ahead yeah but you've <laughs> been able to even for Asian Americans in the community you, you've been able to do it seamlessly where you're, you're not a you're not coming off as preachy you're not coming off as judgy and then you're you, you just you you have this authentic self, a sense of self and that i really wish i had man you you have this kind of you know if i don't if i don't have your self-esteem i would love to have your jaw lines or one of your abs or two of your abs i would love to have that you just have something that is just uh very incredibly special and um by the way i'd be remiss to say too that that you playing Ali Wong's boyfriend always be my maybe. I mean, you got to do. We, we talk about this off air all the time. We, you and I just got to do a comedy there because you you do some stuff, man, off camera. It just makes me it laugh so hard, and you know people are expecting that from me. But uh, it's like it's just like time to see you do that comedy, man, because you're a funny mother. I, I remember texting you that. I was like, dude, you're a funny motherfucker there's like so many and you're like come on dude don't pay <laughs> like, i was like no you're like so <laughs> you, guys, like me. you guys are the, the the masters at this stuff i mean it's you know you got when you make it look easy you you, you you know how good they are at it and so like i remember when i first started acting i was like ah, the acting stuff doesn't look so hard and then you start trying it you know so the fact that you guys can do what you do uh so seamlessly is is a, is a testament to how good you are and i'm just trying to have some fun and play in those waters but so, so come from coming from you that's uh that's saying a lot but i will say that i had a, a great time and you know i think i don't know we're still good. we have another hour ahead of us daniel so, uh, <laughs> no, I, I have a question we're, for you, like, yeah okay. we're going to talk about your arc on er in about a, in, in a couple of minutes <laughs> you got my imdb up right in front of you don't shows, <laughs> dog. i'm an actual doctor i had to create my own show to be a doctor on a show <laughs> 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 that's the only way we can get on 
<laughs> uh, I totally lost my train of thought now. I don't even remember what I was going to say. I think you're trying to wrap it up, and we said, oh, no, 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 but, no, no, no I, that's what I was going to say. I, I have a question for you, because yeah. part of the reason why I felt like um, I, I could do the work that I did on Always Be My Maybe is because I felt so comfortable and I trusted the uh, Ali and Randall and everyone I, and, and Notch and everyone I was on set with. And I don't know if I could have done comedy in any other way. But for you guys, um, I don't know if that's a requirement or something that allows you to feel the freedom to, to, to make incredibly big choices and to try and make people laugh. Because I can't imagine that community, it was a laugh riot every single day. And yet, you know, you made everyone laugh. The community was I, was, I was really, strange to me because oh, it actually I, was a laugh a minute. I mean, I mean, community was one of the first few shows I've been on. It 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 actually was a laugh a minute. Like there was just so much. The hours were incredibly long, but the way I've just never been on the set to pass the time. Everybody, I mean, the amount of jokes that were going back and forth. That was like a show within a show. You almost live. You almost live for the hang. You know. I know Lost was long hours. You know, but and but we we had long hours. Um, but we were able to. I mean, just to see Donald Glover riff. You know, or or Jim Rash especially. Daniel, you know. when I carried Ken for six years. <laughs> stop saying that. The community. <laughs> that dude. Stop. Stop saying that. When stop I. That. It, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I realize what I've said. That's wrong. Um. I, I will say this. <laughs> you should keep, bit, dude, you should keep saying that every every interview to promote the right. podcast. When I can't we, can, and no, I just, but when yeah. we, yeah, I will do that. No, but when we would, the bits we would do, uh, the inside jokes became uh, as almost as important as the show. And <laughs> I'm sure, uh, look, we, <laughs> on Lost, I'm sure you guys had hilarious bits going all the time when you guys were having to run through the jungle and bare feet constantly. But uh, Josh told us about running in bare feet and he, and I was like, but you're running through the jungle. It must've been fun. He's like, no, 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 no. They would take apart cars in the jungle and then they would rust and the car parts would be everywhere. And I was like, <laughs> tell me this story. He was like, yeah, I thought I was going to get lockjaw every day because I would step on a bumper from a 1980 <laughs> oh my god, 280Z or something and I was like, "Oh, yeah, we did not have to deal with that. We just we would complain about not uh going outside and you guys shot always outside." So, yeah, no, it it was a uh, it was a good time. And then well, would you say that, that it's a requirement for comedy for you that you feel that freedom, or could you work in an environment that was, let's say, you were work, working with an asshole and you just didn't I've worked work with those. Yeah, and so can you still be funny? And what's what's the difference for you guys? Oh, that's that's a hot potato. That's a Daniel <laughs> Kim hot potato. He just threw out. I mean, I I think you just there, I I think. I think we, I think Joel and I have done this so much and so long that you just kind of, you know, we're professionals. We kind of pride ourselves that we can work in any environment, you know, I think at the end of the day. So we're, we, you know, at the end of the day, you're, th you're just there to do your job. That's the most important. And then, sure. but if you, if you look, if you luck out and be on a show like Lost or Community, then you can have fun while you're doing your job, which is why. You know, just like you guys, you guys are so or close. When they have to get make sure they get the asshole out soon because they poison things. Who, who do you, who do you, who are you like? Who are some of your closest friends from Los Angeles? Oh, keep in well, touch with? thanks for asking. Oh, you're asking Daniel. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I'm not I, asking who you keep in touch with from Los Angeles. Actually, Josh, Josh Holloway is. Uh, is, is he, one of my and he has a place in Hawaii. Uh, he told me about ways back, well, way back when he was like he bought early. Mm -hmm. uh that was very smart yeah josh uh he's he actually he's done he's done well he's a he's a savvy dude and uh you you know you know the the character he plays on uh lost is a little bit of a country bumpkin but he's definitely not that um and uh and harold parano is uh you know he, he's a, he, i consider both of them to be lifelong friends they, those guys are uh you know the ones that you know it's like you and joel like you guys yeah. You know, you can call each other anytime, pick up the phone, bust on each other and just have a great time. And that's 
that's Josh and Harold for me. Um, but I'm, I'm in touch with a lot of the cast, like Ian Cusick, who played Desmond. Uh, yeah, Steve. I've met him. He's so nice now. Yeah, he was such a great guy. And, yeah. And, we're we're still really tight because and we're in Hawaii. And our, our wives are really good friends, and so, um, you know, they're. I'm I'm lucky. You know, if you if you can come away from a job with like one or two people that you really can call a friend, then then you're fortunate. And I've got a few of those uh, off of that off of Lost, and so, you know, what more can you ask for? Well, you know, what I know. Your... I'll go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry, buddy. <laughs> well, I was gonna say. What is it, Joel? <laughs> I love this because we did not have this. I mean, I knew the moment like there was a moment it was two years later at Comic-Con where I was like, oh, people like the show. And I because I we spent so much time going, uh, we we're just trying to stay on the air. NBC was like, good luck on getting your second season, uh, third season. But obviously Lost was a mega worldwide hit. And now Community is. I think we can all agree on that. But um what can you just say like an anecdotal moment when you went, oh, everything is different. This mm-hmm. thing is this thing has changed the, the, like I'm on a thing that is going to change, not going to change my life. But what was just some I just want to know. I love the moments where you went, oh, shit, yeah. I'm on a hit. I'm on a hit. This yeah. is a hit. And this is all happening. And what oh. was it can be the smallest thing where someone walks up to you just staring at you at an airport or something, but I would love to know that. I love those moments. Three stories come to mind, and they're quick, so I'll, I'll share them all. But the first is we went uh, – we'd been shooting Lost in Hawaii, and you know we'd just been doing our thing. We were living in our little bubble, and you know when we were starting to see the ratings, we, were, we had heard that we were successful, but we didn't really know what that meant. Uh, but sometime in November of our first season, we were invited back to the DGA to, because they were going to do a screening of the show um, in, in L.A. And, um, and so I remember the entire cast or most of the cast got on the same flight from Honolulu to Los Angeles. And as we were shuffling on to the flight, uh, we could hear some of the people like going <gasps> like super excited. Wow. About, like being genuinely scared because... We were the survivors of a plane crash. So it was a mix of like awe oh, and dread. <laughs> it's my favorite show. We're all dead. It's my favorite show. Oh exactly. no. And Oceanic remember, flight. Oh, yeah. I remember thinking, oh, uh, actually, this is starting to have an impact. No pun intended. And so, <laughs> so we went to we went to this event, and um, we all like had car services to the event. And as we were coming around the DGA building, we saw a line wrapped around the block to get into the screening of this. And this this is like an LA block, not a New York block. So this is like lots of people, not socially distanced. And so, <laughs> uh, and so that was a second clue. And then. We did the panel, and it was raucous, and everyone was cheering, and it was this thing that we'd never experienced before. And there were so many people outside when the panel was done that uh, the organizers were like, "We can't take you to the front door. I'm sorry. We're gonna have to. We're gonna have to take you out." Wow. And so uh, we were all like, "Okay." And we all kind of were shuffling, being shuffled toward toward our individual cars. And when the back door opened. It was like a freaking rock concert because someone yelled, "There they are!" <laughs> <laughs> immediately, immediately, the people from the front were coming around, running and screaming in a horde, like uh, toward the back, where the, in the parking lot where our cars were. And I got into my car, I shut the door, and they surrounded the car. As I felt like I was a rock star for a minute, like. And they literally started shaking and rocking the car back and forth. What? Kid you not. I never, ever felt that in my life. And and so that was going on for a good couple of minutes before security came and, like, cleared everyone out. And then we could proceed. That was the craziest thing. And that's when I knew that there was something going on with this show. No. And then, and then the, the extension of that was... You know, every summer they do these like uh, international press tours and things like that. You know, for and they send some of the cast out to Europe and uh, and Asia and other uh, incredibly beautiful places. Uh, and so I got asked to go to 
London uh, to promote the show. And I was walking down the street in Soho, and I started noticing <clears throat> that people were following me, just like like one just kind of like out of the corner of my eye I could see. And then as I turned the corner, it turned into like five, and then it turned into like 10. And before you knew it, like I had like a horde of like 30, 40, 50 people following me down the streets of Soho. And I did not know what to do at that moment. So I had this instinct that I should run. I don't know why. <laughs> it's been a hard <laughs> day's <laughs> night. So There's 50 people following you. Because I started to panic, you know, a little bit like, what's about to happen? You know, I, I can't stop and then greet them. I, I, I didn't know. And I was actually getting close to my hotel. So I started to run and they started to run. And then it became this thing of, well, you know, I don't know what to do. And so literally... They started chasing me and following me down the street. And then once I got to the, the to the hotel, I stopped and I said, "This is ridiculous. What am I doing?" I stopped and I met, I greeted them all. They all came up. I signed autographs, uh, took photos for about 20, 30 minutes, and and it's one thing to experience that in the U.S., but a whole other thing for an Asian boy in the middle of London to be chased down the street like a beetle, you know? And I would yeah. never compare myself to a beetle. You know, I would never ever do anything like that, but it must be just a small sliver of what like these really incredibly famous people experience on a daily basis. That's beautiful. That is good. Right? Wow. Ken, imagine if that ever happened to you. Oof. No, I was walking down London um, oh, no, last year on the West End, and I literally was following great. 50 or 60 people to see if they <laughs> <laughs> I was following a lot of people. Oh, my but God. You had, uh, you <laughs> had that, though. I'd like, wear a derby, and I'd wear a big hangover uh, hangover T-shirt. Boy, man. Ugh, you know, and I try to speak. And, you know, oh, I quite like that Leslie Chow, isn't it? It's right. <laughs> you get away from me, sir. You know, no, well, you've right. the stories, though. I'm sure that you've had those kinds of experiences. I mean, community is huge. And, you know, Ken, of course, the Hangover movies, I'd, I'd be surprised if you don't have a story like that. I mean, there are, I mean, I think I think we've all had those kind of the, those moments. But I, I, I think with. Uh, you won't tell I, a story. I think no. I think with I think the story. With, no, no, I, I, Man, tell I, the story. No, no, this is all about DDK. But I, 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 but there's something to be said about a TV show on ABC every Wednesday night. You know, I was watching every week in real time. Just rock stars. That so so you're seeing rock stars once a week in your home for six years. I, I I've. There are literally books written about what ABC yeah. did in that season with Desperate Housewives and Lost, where yeah. they just went, oh, we're going to become the number one network overnight. It's going to happen. And it did. It uh, was, yeah, it, we were part of a phenomenon. Like that was that same year was Lost, uh, Desperate Housewives and Grey's Anatomy all right. in the same season. So yeah, that, yeah. with like, scripts that because you crazy. know with, with scripts like especially towards the end, I mean, would you just get for certain episodes? This is the dumb fanboy question in me, but with, for certain episodes or let's say for season finales, would you get the would you either get the script late or you know or get fragments of the script or or you know I don't know if you one would sign an NDA, but just to would they shoot fake endings? You know, would they do certain things? Because mm -hmm. if anyone's going to do a swerve, it would be lost, you know? Yeah. So. Yeah. Well, I will say that we did we did have fake endings for the seasons. Uh, and so, uh, and we were. That under, is a good problem. Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, I've never experienced that. That's amazing. Yeah. So we would shoot certain things and, and put out decoy scripts as well, you know, every once in a while just to protect ourselves. And uh, we were under very strict orders not to say anything to anyone. Um, and uh, and we would get our, we would only get our scripts a few days in advance of, of shooting, just like uh, I'd imagine you guys. And so yeah, we uh, get them the morning we were shooting them. Yeah, right. And so and sometimes yeah. we, you know, <laughs> right before we start shooting. them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's. You know, we get rewrites and stuff as well, but because we didn't really know what our characters' fates were going to be, 
we as soon as we would get the script, we would just start rifling through it right away. It's not like you know other shows that I've been on where you get the script, you know, and you just put it on the table and you get to it when you get to it. As soon as we got these scripts for Lost, we were all going through them. Wow. See, we got stuff where they'd be like, so the last episode of the of you know of the season can it be the season and series finale this year can you somehow <laughs> double that up that's, that's what we get feeling. that's a big morale booster isn't that it? is a wonderful that <laughs> that that happened the fourth season and i was just like oh boy here but we go like the little engine that could that i mean and that's what you built now since then i mean i feel like it's gotten bigger even after the show stopped airing is that is that right yeah, it's like a, an out of control case of herpes, <laughs> where That's what I was you think it's gone, <laughs> and then it just keeps coming, and then you're like, eh, "It's fine, I, it's fine," and then just we just kept coming back, and all we're of the, a sudden, we're the cold sore of comedy. You're in real trouble. <laughs> Ken, we've kept Daniel on for two hours. I know. It, it was well worth it. This it's, is it's it's 3.30 in the afternoon. And, and I know. I'm sorry, Dan. I just to me, I'm just A, I'm glad you're you're better. And uh, you know, I, I, I hope those moments that you're having right now, uh, like even the the periods of focus, I I hope it's fatigue. I hope it's just something that is a constitutional symptom and, and I'm just praying that, you know, you know, just the, even the little the the little bits are are just I just want it all gone for you you know I just want everything you know yeah because um I, I just uh I, I, you look amazing and I I just can't wait when all this is said and done just to go to your home and just you know just just have a beer man or eight you know and uh, just to hang out because uh, I, it to me and uh, it's 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 lovely to see you healthy and thank you joel for asking all the questions because it's just there there's a moment there just watching you man i i just sometimes it, it's very hard to interview interview you because i i love you so much it's just it's just hard to you know you just don't want to see a friend suffer so i'm just glad you're i'm just glad you're on the men brother you you look fucking amazing and that's so good yeah i just can't believe we talked about the guy from the babylon 5 spinoff <laughs> see what i did there these are deep cuts from here. <laughs> Cut questions from Daniel going, dude, you don't know me. And Daniel goes, you don't know me. <laughs> oh, he was on Star Trek Enterprise, and I watched all 11 episodes of it. Excuse me, it went, it went almost too slow. But, uh, but, you know, Joel, it's been great to get to know you a little bit, too. Like, And any friend of Ken's is a friend of mine. So if you're ever in Hawaii, uh, please come visit. And uh, Can I stay in the Daniel COVID suite? <laughs> yeah, what? that's what we're, we're Check in. right now. Uh, it's going to go right on the door. Uh, oh, I will. I would love for your... <laughs> I would love for one of your family members to hose my family down when we come visit. Uh, <laughs> well, I know I'm, I know I'm making light of all this, but I say <laughs> it because we are now in week eight of all this crap. But uh, boy, Ken, I didn't I didn't want to say this, but you have lovely friends, and that's really uh, shocking. And uh, <laughs> no, uh, Daniel, I. Like before, I know there's so much gushing going on, but you know, yeah, it is like even your T-shirt is on point. So uh, uh, <laughs> you're thank you for sharing your experience. And, and uh, uh, because it is it is I think it's really important for people to hear what the people go through and how you handled it, which is educating yourself and. Uh, and so I believe, yeah, I, I, I'll stop gushing cause you're the, like me where you're like, all right, stop talking. But all I want to say is watch that PBS, uh, documentary, watch the good doctor. Uh, and for all you young kids watching out there, it is a well go back and watch lost because Please. it is, it is going to go down in television history. And the fact that Daniel is uh, two years older than Ken makes no <laughs> sense in this universe. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Good night. End of I podcast. Think that, I think we end on that. I think much. we end on that. <laughs>